start. Hello and welcome back to Calculus 3 section 15.6 on tangent planes, linear approximation and differentials. So the tangent plane will show us uh, the um, like it, equivalent of what the tangent line is to the point on the, uh, to the function at a point. The tangent plane would be to the surface at the point. So you are eventually all working over here towards that goal to eventually you know stick the tangent plane to your head graduation head remember it's flat that's the tangent plane to your head so that's what you're working towards they should have only available to those who took calc 3 but they give it to everyone anyway so the tangent plane can be expressed explicitly or implicitly, depending on the uh, type of function that you have as an input. There is a difference when you have a surface, which is given as f of x equals blah, 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 f of x, y, uh, and when you have, let's say, a, a ball, a sphere, which has x, y, and z all buried together without possibility to isolate z equals everything else. So for the explicit functions the definition is the explicit function is z equals f of x y so the, the previous section we had these functions given in this one and then you have implicit which is actually explicit functions implicit surface we can't say implicit function because a ball is not a function right it fails uh, there will be uh, that f of x y z is equal to zero so one and two so example for number one would be z equals three x y squared plus 4y minus sine xy, let's say. So this would be explicit. And then let's say implicit is the one when you can't solve it for z equals. So maybe you have, let's just take a ball, center that, 1, 2, 3. So x minus 1 squared plus y minus 2 squared plus z minus 3 squared equals to, let's say, now, 4, radius 2. Now, that would be this form. Uh, to get it into this form, all you need to do is to move 4 to the other side. It's minus 4, and you will have it equal to 0, and you're good to go. So functions can be as uh, written as explicit, and then implicit for surfaces where they're not functions, right? So we cannot write it as z equals everything else. So now, why is that important? Well, it's important because now I'm going to uh, come up with the equation of the plane uh, at the point uh, ABC that is containing the derivatives. Because the derivatives are the ones that um, will give us those three-dimensional slopes. If you remember your tangent line from calc 1, the tangent line in calc 1, your first derivative gave you the slope of the tangent line, and then you went and calculated b. So much like that, we have a definition here for tangent plane. And um, this one is for the implicit f of x, y, z, equals zero so if you have this one then all you need to do is to uh, set up a point p0 which is abc that's the point you want your tangent plane at uh, we need uh, del of um, 
of FABC to be not zero. And now we have so fx computed at abc times x minus a plus fy computed at abc times y minus b plus fz at abc times z minus c equal to zero so this is your tangent plane now if you compare this i'm going to erase it just just look at it if you remember this used to be a and then x minus x zero plus b y minus y zero plus c z minus z zero equals zero so this was the equation of the plane earlier. And we had, there was the vector n. Vector n was a, b, c. So now we are just confusing everyone here by changing the notation. Because now vector n is so new notation vector n is the del of f which is fx fy fz so it's no longer abc and we compute at abc so notation is different now but it's the, still the same shape equation of the plane is equation of the plane no matter which letters you're using so instead of having a times x minus x zero now you have partial derivative of x computed at a point because that's going to give you a value so now we know to find the tangent plane so let's find the tangent plane Uh, at some shape just going to jump into homework section you guys can solve the problems that are done in the book so they give you a ball this is problem 14 x squared oh it's not a ball sorry x squared plus y cubed plus z to the 4 equals to 2 that's not a ball it's a ball has to have square 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 and they're asking for negative 1 0 1 right tangent plane tp tangent plane all right you can write f x y z is x squared plus y cubed plus z to the four minus two equal to zero so i moved that two to the other side and now i have my implicit form for the surface it's not a function because i can't write it as z equals everything else therefore not a function it's some kind of surface you can go add them and graph it in Mathematica and see what it is. So now, what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to find partial derivatives. So fx is just 2x, fy is 3y squared, and fz is 4z cubed. And now I'm going to compute that at negative 1, 0, 1. So fx is going to be negative 2 fy is going to be 0 and fz is going to be 4 
So the tangent plane is negative 2 x plus 1 plus big fat 0 plus 4 z minus 1 equals to 0 and now we have negative 2x minus 2 plus 4z plus, uh, minus 4 equal to 0 negative 2x plus 4z equals to 6 right negative 2 negative 4 that's negative 6 move it to the other side and now just to you know make the first one positive and divide by 2 so how about we divide by negative 2 because you can reduce you get x minus 2z equals to negative 3 and that's the tangent plane tangent plane at negative 1 0 1 now you have to change the point if you want a different tangent plane you change the point and the whole calculation changes because with a different point the values that you plug in for x, y, and z would be different, so partial derivatives would be different, the values you put in parentheses would be different, which results in a different plane at the end. When you're thinking of the tangent plane, I want you to think of the graduation hat, which has that flat piece on top, and that flat piece on top is touching your head at the single point. So, just like the tangent line, we in mathematics say kisses the line because there is only one point at which they touch, right? Being having this one mouth to make one kiss, right? So, uh, we actually use that term. So, we say tangent line kisses the function. That immediately means that the tangent line is touching the function at exactly one point. So, now the tangent plane kisses the surface, right? Which means it's touching the surface at that one point. The rest of the points in the neighborhood are all going to be close, which we are going to ex uh, exploit later in our second part to come up with linear approximations. But before we get there, let's take a look at the uh, explicit form for tangent line. Uh, which is, in some sense, completely pointless because you can always use this one. See, if you have an explicit function, let's say you have z equals xy plus 3x squared, I don't care, whatever. So if you have this, this is in the form z equals function of xy. So we're happy here, right? This is what we call explicit form. But what you can do quickly is you can transform this into capital F of x, y, z is equal to x, y plus 3x squared minus z equal to 0, and then just use, use the above, right? Use the above method. So there is no need for this second part. But you know what? Since we are already here and talking about it, we can also define the tangent plane for z equals fxy. Right. And that one, well, at point A, B. So now you have a domain, you have point A, B in the domain. You can calculate f of A, B to get uh, the third value. And the tangent plane would be given by z equals fx computed at A, B, x minus A, plus fy computed at A, B, times y minus B, plus f of A, B. So this is the formula.
And now, if you have the, you know, any kind of a function, a point, you can quickly compute the tangent line by simply just plugging these values in. So say you have z equals f of x, y, say 2xy squared minus 3x um, at the point 1, negative 3. You can come up with a tangent line for this quickly. You have your fx, derivative in respect to x, 2y squared minus 3. And you have your derivative fy, which would be 4xy. So now, to compute at 1, negative 3, your fx would be plug in 1. No, there's no x to plug in 1. Uh, negative 3, that's 9, 18, 15. And fy, negative 12. So the tangent plane is given by z equals 15 x minus 1 minus 12 y plus 3 uh, plus, oh I forgot to compute uh, a z value, oops, uh, so f of 1, 3, we also, f of 1, negative 3, we also need that one. Uh, so that's uh, 9, 18, minus, plus 9, so 27. And now you can, you can clean it up the same way, right? Just do some, do some algebra. You have your 15x minus 15 minus 12y minus 36 minus z plus 27 equals to 0 to put it in a form that we are used to for the plane so we have our 15x minus 12y minus z is equal to and now i have to just deal with these uh, 36 27 that's negative 9 negative 24 so positive 24 I hope this is this worked out fine. So this over here is the tangent plane at one negative three. You change the location, the entire equation of the plane would change. Now as I mentioned, you can just move z as a minus z on top and just use the previous procedure. Uh, there is really no need to remember both, but then, you know, maybe you want to, so it's, it's fine. Now, this form is good because of linear approximations, which is the second part of our lecture. Linear approximation is something that was very, very useful prior to age of calculators. Now, it's much easier to explain this using the calculus one analog than to go and draw the 3D surfaces with a plane. So if I go back to calc one real quick and talk about approximations, it will make more sense. So, Say you want to compute a square root of 5. Now we need to paint a scenario over here. You are stuck at the desert island. Your cell phone battery is dead. You forgot to bring your uh, TI-83 to your cruise. Um, oh, well, everyone else is dead, obviously. And Wilson is gone too. So, you just want to compute root 5 by hand. And you can. Because if you realize that this gives you the function square root of x, 
we can see a few things from this graph. You see over here, one, two, three, four. Over here is a perfect square root that gives us value of two on the y-axis. But we are interested at five, which is in the neighborhood. So we are interested at this point here. We want to know the y value for that, which is clearly higher on the y axis, right? So if I draw the y axis over here, here is 2, and we are interested in this value here. Now, if I draw the tangent line through 4, now in our case, that tangent line is going to be tangent plane on the surface. If the tangent line goes through this point perfectly, it's not going to go through this point perfectly. But look how close they are. So instead of computing the square root of 5, which is computing 5 in a black line, you compute 5 in the red line, and the red line is a linear line you have a stick, you have sand, so you can just compute these things by hand. Let's go and see. So to find the tangent line at a equals 4, so we know that we need to find the derivative, which is 1 over 2 root x, slope m, we plug in 4. So the whole thing is 1 quarter. So now that I have the derivative to be one quarter. I can calculate y equal mx plus b. So y is two, m is one quarter, x is four, plus b. These guys cancel. b equals one, which gives me that the tangent line uh, is given by y equals one quarter x plus one. It makes sense. You see that it goes through 1 over here. It's awesome. So now, square root of 5 is approximately the same as calculating tangent line at 5. So 1 quarter times 5 plus 1. 1 quarter times 5, that's uh, 1.25 plus 1. So we get that the square root of 5 is approximated by 2.25. All of these calculations you can do with a stick in the sand. Now, let's say you get rescued, right? They're trying to give you the water and all of these kind of things, right, to see if you have any medical issues and so on, obviously the only thing you want is the calculator to check this. So they give you the calculator. And the calculator says that square root of 5 is approximately 2.23607. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, look at that. 1.4 cents off. 1.4 cents. <laughs> it's nothing, right? So you're able to compute anything, anything, by hand. If you are able to find the closest value that you can compute by hand, get the tangent line at that point, and then compute the value you were supposed to compute in a function in the tangent line rather than the original function. Now the same thing applies. Now you can clearly see how useful this is if you don't have calculators on computers. All you need to go is 50 years ago. 50 years ago, all right? So 50 years ago, no computers, no calculators around. So what you can compute by hand is what you have. So clearly a skill like this is essential 
because you really don't want to compute square root of pi or ln of 3 or ln of 2, right? You use e for those. You want to calculate these things uh, to the good precision, right, with uh, tangent lines. So now, moving to calculus 3, we're going to have the same deal. I'm going to have some kind of a surface of whatever that surface is. And then, if I want to know the value here, I might find the tangent point plane at the point that it's next to it, easy, and then compute the value that I want to know in the tangent plane, because all linear calculations, no roots, no squares, so when you when you find the tangent plane, obviously, right, it's gonna be all linear calculations. So now going to calc three. Back to calc three. We are looking at the linear approximation which is technically just a tangent plane. at the point at the point nearby at maybe I should say at the convenient at the convenient point nearby so linearization xy is just going to be the tangent plane formula which you guys already seen so fx at AB, X minus A, plus FY, AB, times Y minus B, plus F of AB. That's the tangent plane formula. We're, we are not learning anything new here. And... Uh, if you want the explicit one which is the one that it's stronger XYZ is going to be FX computed at a BC times X minus a plus FY ABC times Y minus B plus FZ ABC times Z minus C plus F of ABC. As you can see, it's a long but simple equation. You can use it to trigger others. It's really good. They say what's new. Just write this down and start talking about partial derivative f of x and that will be it. You will be not bothered any longer. So it's a really good equation. So now the example of this, uh, we're just gonna do the tangent line again. Let's see something, something beautiful. Great. Problem 37 looks great enough. f of x, y, z is given as ln of 1 plus x plus y plus 2z. And we are supposed to compute f of 0.1 negative 0 0.2 and 0 0.2 so you're looking at this and you go really right so what is the cool point to to consider zero 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 you consider zero 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 because yeah it's close enough
Now, if you are computing a function at 0, 0, 0, the answer is 0, right? Because ln of 1 is 0. But that's not why we are all here today in such large numbers. We are going to compute fx, and fx is going to be partial of this, which is 1 plus x plus y plus 2z, and then 1 on top. Fy, you always copy the denominator is always the function, and then the derivative no copying on top. And then yz, 1 plus x plus y plus 2z, and then we get a 2 on top in this case. So cross your z's so that you are not confusing it with 2's. Now we get to compute this at 0, 0, 0. We get fx, 1. Get fy, 1. We have z, 2. So now the tangent plane, which is our linear approximation, linear approximation at uh, x, y, z, is going to be given by 1 times x minus 0 plus 1 times y minus 0 plus 2 times z minus 0 because we are centered at 0, 0, 0 equal to 0 so l, x, y, z is going to be given by x plus y plus 2z so our function at 0 0.1, negative 0 0.2, 0 0.2 will be approximately equal to the L computed at 0 0.1, negative 0 0.2, 0 0.2 which is simply x is 0 0.1 plus y is negative 0 0.2 plus 2 times 0 0.2 which the whole thing is 0 0.3. So f of 0 0.1, negative 0 0.2, 0 0.2 is roughly approximated by 0 0.3. Now, if I am to check this, Let's see what the calculator says. So what is my function? ln of 1 plus x is 0 0.1 minus 0 0.2 plus 0 0.4 And the calculator value gives us that f at 0 0.1, negative 0 0.2, 0 0.2 is 0 0.26, 2, 3, and so on. Well, that's four cents off. <laughs> so it's very close, as you can see. Again, unfortunately, we don't have a need for this today because we have computers, we have calculators. Um, those of you that are computer science, if you're still sitting in this class, um, you can program this uh, easy and then just have the input ask for a function and ask for a point. So three input values, right? The function, the point, and the point of approximation. And uh, at that point, it reduces you knowing how to compute this to uh, just knowing where to compute it at. So you can make a, a fun little calculator out of this. Uh, I have a student who coded um, yeah, uh, coded in Calc 1 linear approximation and then uh, in Calc 2 uh, programmed in the Taylor expansion for the polynomial um, for a couple of terms. So you can um, you can code that in Java use some loops and it's not a not a big deal. So the tangent line, tangent plane, tangent plane is going to uh, be used 
in this linear approximation. As I said, instead of computing the point, because you don't want to take ln, um, you get to um, compute in the tangent plane when it's easy. So plug in 0 0.1, negative 0 0.2, 0 0.2, compute those and get 0 0.3, which is close. But over here, you have to compute the ln of it. So this was ln of 1 point something to give you this value. So I know 1.3, right? Yep. So it was calculating the numbers in here versus calculating a line of 1.3. The third and the final part of this lecture is to talk about differentials. Now, differentials approximate change. They don't approximate values. The tangent plane, the previous, approximated z value. Let's say you don't want to compute the square root, you don't want to compute ln, blah, 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 right? You use linear approximation, and that gives you the z value. Now, for differentials, which is this dz stuff, differentials, they approximate the change. So, differentials approximate change, in parentheses, not the value. So, value is approximated by the procedure before. Now, the, this one approximates the change when one of the or more of these input values change. A quick explanation of this, again going back to Calc 1, real quick. Um, so, in Calc 1, the exact change was delta y as y2 minus y1. And y1 was the function of x1, and y2 was the function of x2. So if you want to calculate the change exactly, you will calculate these two numbers, again, using calculators as a joke, and then just subtract them, and you're done. Now, obviously, you will say, well, what's the big deal? I just do that. Well, exactly, because you have calculators, you have cell phones, you have computers. You need to think about 100 years ago, or 300 years ago when this was invented. No calculators, no computers, nothing to do, so if you are trying to calculate the change in volume of the sphere. Well, in that case, you have to do a lot of cubing and times pi and all of that stuff, and that will just be annoying. It takes a long time. So people naturally figured out the faster way to do this and get the result that it's still really good. It's not exact, but it's, it's still good. So see, volume of the sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. If your radius grows from 3 to 3.1, then the volume changes and you want to know how much. So if, if, the, if the radius changes a little bit, how much does the volume change? Now again, what are you going to do? Well, today you're just gonna plug in 3.1 in R and compute the whole thing in a calculator, get a number. Then plug three in R, use a calculator, get a number, subtract two numbers and be done. So for the whole thing, guys, it's gonna be literally, you know, a minute, less than a minute for you to calculate exact change, right? But differentials say the exact change in volume can be approximated 
by the differential, and differential is the derivative of r times delta r. Now, delta r is nu minus old value, in our case, 0 0.1. So I need a derivative. So dv is uh, 4 pi r squared delta r. So dv is 4 pi r is 3 squared, and this is 0 0.1. And as you can see now, these calculations are very quick. I have 3 times 3 squared is 9. 9 times 4 is 36 times uh, 0.1 is 3.6 pi and now you can write pi as uh, 3.14 you know stick in a sand or a goose feather right that's what you write with because this is 300 years ago and you calculate by hand 3.6 times 3.14 to give you a value i will cheat with the calculator so this is 3.6. I mean, it's around 10, but 3.14. So 3.6 times 3.14, 11.304. So the change in volume of the sphere is about 11.304 units cubed. So that's our approximation. So this was Calc 1. So in Calc 1, what you do is you, instead of calculating the exact change, you find the derivative, you find the dr, and just plug these things in. So now, when you go to Calc 3, you just do the same thing with partial derivatives, one in fx and one in fy direction, and that's it. So now, I'm going to calc 3, we have our differential delta z approximated by dz, which is fx um, delta x plus fy delta y. Now guys, these things are extremely important. If you think about the cars, let's say. I did talk about at one point in time that the cars we are driving are extremely inefficient. Three quarters of the money you, you put in your gas tank is wasted. Wasted to heat and friction and, and all of these other noise. And only 25% of the money you pay, so 10 bucks out of 40, is what drives you from point A to B uh, for the duration of a whole tank and does your music and air conditioning and everything else. In comparison to Tesla, that is 98% efficient in regards to what electricity you put into the batteries and then take. Because it has no moving parts, has no friction, and all of that stuff that uh, our commercial cars, that it's and if you think about our cars, guys, it's already 150 year old technology. We're just making it go faster and make less noise but we are still exploding dead plants and animals in the engine block um, to go from point A to the point B. That's what the oil is for. Right? Yeah. Exactly. So, um, when you think of the, the, the car design, we have the engine block, right, and you have the cylinders and pistons that move up and down. So what you do is you, you sprinkle some gas, you, sprinkle, you put some oxygen, and there's a spark plug on the bottom. The spark plug ignites with a little spark ignites that makes it explode right and the explosion pushes the piston up and the piston moves the crank and now when you have six of those moving around right they provide continuous spin to the axle and the car goes obviously extremely inefficient but believe it or not nuclear fission the one that we use nuclear plants right now is actually even more inefficient than that it's only five percent of the, it produces all the electricity you need and more, but it's only 5% efficient. Uh, 
So that's probably one of the most inefficient machines that we use, and, and uh, that's why the fusion we need it as, as soon as possible. Anyway, well, nuclear waste is the, the biggest biggest issue. And meltdowns <laughs> here and there. Uh, it happens, right? As a teacher would say. Yeah, I was there. No salad for. Uh, I mean, I wasn't there, but two countries, two countries over. So no salad, no spinach for uh, for about a year. And as a kid, you go yes. But then <laughs> now I just can't have enough spinach. Anyway, you grow. Um, so when you think about the piston that it's moving in the engine, it's a three-dimensional object. And what happens with anything uh, when it's heated? It expands, right? So these things have to be carefully designed because, guys, remember, you are exploding gas in the engine. Why is the engine hot? Because there is fire, there are explosions. Millions and millions of controlled explosions in the car engine, and it's warming the things up, 1,000, 2,000 degrees, right? And the engine block needs to be heavy, needs to be thick, needs to be designed properly to withstand all those explosions and uh, needs to also be done to specifications so that when, due to temperature, pistons and everything expands, uh, it has the tight fit. Why do you want to warm up the car before you leave in the winter, especially? Because the pistons should be loose at that point, and there should be, because they are, they, it's very cold, they shrunk a little bit, right? And uh, you turn on the car, it's not instant heat. There is heat, but heat is applied to metal over time. So a lot of gases that are pushing the piston after the explosion are escaping on the sides because the piston didn't expand yet to the point where it's designed, how much it expands because the material properties and this calculation tells us how much, right? Um, so they carefully measure, compute, and all of that, and then they drill a hole in which the piston goes. Um, the cylinder, right? So, um, in the winter, uh, if you just turn the car on and you start driving, you're not going to have the same amount of power in the car as if when you warmed up the car uh, for some time so that the piston had the time to warm up to its operating temperature, expanded enough so gases are not ex ex uh, escaping on the sides of the piston, right? So. There's that design, a whole bunch of other things, but this one is cool because it's kind of expanding three-dimensionally, right? Um, it suspends in all, all possible directions, and uh, you want to know how much. Now, we have equations for cylinder. We, we talked about those equations, so we can uh, actually do those calculations here, and that will be the part of you engineering the engine block, which we're actually phasing out. But, um, again, Right? We, need to, we need to know how the stuff from 100 years ago works in order to um, know what the flaws are and to be motivated to um, come up with something new. So here is your derivative of the function and the change in x direction and the derivative of function in respect to y and the change in the y direction. So now we're going to take a look at the a word problem and see honors college should uh, honor students should take a look at 45 for homework it's a good exam question or something similar problem 45 on page Page something, uh, 981, page 981. So it's um, area of an ellipse. I know we discussed it already, area of the ellipse, but now we want to see how it changes as the... Uh, let's take a look at the change in the cone volume. So cone volume. And like the ice cream cone. So... The cone volume is given as one third pi r squared h. 
when you have a cone, you have the height h, you have the radius r. So those are the, the specs. They say that the radius changes from 6.5 to 6.6, .6, and the height changes from 4.15, no, 4.20 to 4.15. Approximate the change in volume with the differential. Now, guys, your variables are no longer x and y. Your variables now are r and h. So you will be looking for the function partial derivative r, so fr, which is uh, 2 thirds pi r h, and f h, the partial derivative respect to h, which is 1 third pi r squared. Or just say pi thirds r squared. Remember that delta anything is new minus old. So delta r is 0 0.1 because right it's 0 0.6 minus 0 0.5. And delta h is negative 0 0.05 because the value went down. So as this cone expanded, it lost height. Right? As the radius of the base expanded, it lost height, so it kind of squished a little bit down. So the change in volume is approximated by the differential, which is going to be what? It's going to be our partial derivative. So 2 pi over 3, r was 6.5, age was 4.2 times 0 0.1, so this is all uh, fr part, plus the h part, pi over 3, uh, r is um, 6.5 squared, times negative 0 0.05 for delta h, and this is the h part. So if you take a look quickly at the equation here, look, you have the x part, and you have the y part. So now for the um, differential, you will have the r part and the h part. And all you need to do now is to just calculate these annoyances. So. I mean, it, it completely. If you if you grab a calculator to compute this, like I am right now cheating, it completely defeats the purpose of the whole idea. Because if you were able to, if you had the calculator, you would just calculate the exact change. There's no reason to to go around, right, to calculate all of this so that you can approximate something that you could have computed in the first place. That's such is life. Three point five one. Actually, wait. Age was given as two decimals. We can do three decimals. If you are careful with your significant digits, you know that your calculation. Since this had two decimals here, your calculation is always allowed to have an extra one. So three decimal values. The one that I'm dropping uh, next is four, so that will not increase the last five to a six. So there it is. The change in volume is going to be about three and a half units units cubed. And that is with radius increasing and the height decreasing. Uh, overall, it was the slight increase in volume by 3.5 units.
Ta-da! That's it. I don't have any kind of special closing. Just bye. <laughs>